on the U.S. midterm elections, what the results mean for the U.S. and the world. Um, I could give you the short answer, but they're going to give you the longer answer. Um, uh, instead of protracted introductions, which I thought I might uh, do, it will come up, I think, in the course of what uh, uh, of the discussion. Um, a, a lot of people on the panel are engaged in uh, practice or in scholarship that uh, intersects uh, either directly with political science, in some cases with media, with performance, with um, uh, uh, issues related to gender, with a range of subjects here. Um, and so I'm going to in introduce uh, the panelists, and each one is going to uh, speak for about eight minutes about what, what happened in the American elections, um, uh, because it is not as easy as it might seem to decipher the American electoral landscape, and especially midterm elections, and especially at this very fraught moment. So um, let me introduce the panelists. Each one will speak for about eight minutes, a different perspective, and then they'll engage each other, and we'll quickly, at that point, uh, bring your questions into it. It will be a discussion, and there are uh, multiple perspectives, which is the idea here. Um, uh, a very diverse range of uh, people that we have. Uh, Karim Maktasi is an associate professor of international politics. Um, uh, my own experience with Karim, which has been quite wonderful in the 15 years I've been here, is um, he's uh, really quite wonderful at, uh, among other things, uh, diagnosing uh, the extent to which politics elsewhere affects politics here. So that's one thing I hoped he would talk about. Daniel Reich um, is uh, also uh, an associate uh, professor of, but in this case, comparative politics. Um, uh, he's done extraordinary work on sports uh, and uh, politics, which um, for those of you who have followed the American political landscape in the last few years know that uh, it intersects with key issues such as race, um, uh, Donald Trump has really played the race card when it comes to uh, American sports, uh, for example, in a very ugly way, which is not unexpected because he's done it in so many uh, spheres. But also, um, uh, Daniel um, uh, knows uh, quite a bit about the mechanism of uh, American politics. Uh, for example, the Electoral College and um, the, the different uh, uh, electoral districts, um, uh, the Senate compared to the House, these sorts of things which are very important in trying to interpret what happened. Did the American electorate repudiate uh, Trump? Did they not? Um, uh, Koros Ismaeli, who is my colleague here in the Center for American Studies and Research, is jo uh, jointly appointed um, uh, in media studies. He has worked for the last uh, 20 some odd years as a media activist, as a filmmaker. He's made uh, films that have appeared, for example, on the American uh, uh, program Democracy Now!, which uh, some of you may know, which is really one of the interesting, most interesting, radical, progressive sort of um, uh, programs that's out there, um, uh, sort of analyzing uh, the role of the United States, the U.S. as an empire. Um, he's reported from uh, 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 Baghdad. Uh, he's done work in Iran. Um, and uh, uh, most recently in New York, where he finished his PhD in uh, media studies uh, at NYU. So um, uh, that interesting sort of mix of media activist and media cultural critic or whatever is another window, I think, and a really helpful one. Um, uh, and um, uh, our next guest is Julie Carson, who's the Jabra Visiting Professor in Art, History, and Curating. She also writes a blog and has written really extensively about American politics since the moment shortly before the 2016 election when she predicted correctly that Donald Trump would be elected uh, president of the United States. Um, uh, uh, she has lived uh, and worked for many years in 
California, which itself is a, an extraordinarily uh, particular political landscape. We're seeing an almost complete victory for the Democratic Party in uh, California, which is large enough to be a country certainly unto itself. She'll certainly be able to talk about, among many other things, about uh, gender and politics. As I said, the case of California, um, the sexual politics in um, uh, uh, the Trump campaign. Um, and our final guest, um, who will also be here on Thursday to give a talk um, uh, uh, called Newest American Stories from the Global City, which I'm going to pass around now. I would really encourage you all to come take a look at the notice and please give us your email so that we'll make sure to contact you for future events. That event, he will talk about um, uh, a, a group, uh, a center that he has created um, at Rutgers Newark campus, um, which is about immigration and um, it's uh, one of the, if not the most diverse cities in the United States and he helps uh, the newest Americans, these newest immigrants, create a video to create media, to create mechanisms to tell their own story. So he'll be talking about that project, but among Tim's other um, uh, many accomplishments, um, he comes out of a performance studies background. We originally met when he directed a play that I wrote some 20 years ago at Dartmouth, and he wrote an extraordinary book about this intersection of theatricality and politics about the presidency of Ronald Reagan and was one of the first people to put together the very interesting uh, fields of, uh, of political science and, and performance studies. So um, uh, I'm sure among other things, uh, he will uh, be talking about the extraordinary theatricality or acting out, if you'd like to call it that, of the you know uh, current uh, regime in the U.S. So. Um, each, uh, each of our guests will speak for about eight minutes, and we'll begin, if we may, um, with Karim Makdisi, or would you rather talk, start with Tim? Okay. <laughs> Shall we start in the middle? Shall we go oh, in the middle? Okay. Tim, well, uh, yeah. Well, first of all, thank you, Robert, for um, inviting me here. I actually, when Robert initially invited me here, one of the things I was most excited about was that I was going to escape the fallout of the midterm election in the United States. Um, as Robert said, I live in the New York, New Jersey area. Um, it's been um, a blood sport for many months, and I um, was really looking forward to being in Beirut and not having to think about it for a while. So, <laughs> unfortunately, that's going to be part of the panel. Um, where to begin? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, I think, about immigration and how it figures into the election, and, and, and specifically um, uh, the astonishing fact that I live in a country um, with the first avowedly white nationalist president. Uh, it, 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 it's a shocking fact, but it is a fact. We have a president in the United States who is a white nationalist. Um, that's a kind way to put it. He's, he's, he's a white supremacist. Um, and uh, his father was a white supremacist. He was a member of the John Birch Society. He uh, was sued many times by his tenants for the buildings that he, he, he ran for um, uh, inflicting all sorts of uh, uh, crazy things on his tenants who were largely people of color. Uh, the apple did not fall too far from the tree. Um, Donald Trump has been, uh, I, I, again, the shocking thing to me is I've known this man since the mid-1980s. I'm a New Yorker. Um, in the 1980s, Donald Trump was known as the clown prince of American real estate, right? He was a joke. He was a joke to anybody in New York who knew about him, and, and, and we all did. He was a, uh, a lurid self-promoter who um, managed to go from bankruptcy to bankruptcy, wife to wife, in much the same fashion. He treated his bankruptcy as much the way he treated his marriages. Um, and, and the idea that he would become the president of the United States was an astonishing uh, thing to any of us who knew him back then. One of the reasons that uh, I believe he was successful is he's tapped into a deep vein um, of, um, of American racism, of American white nationalism. Uh, it's no accident that um, Donald Trump has come to power in the United States at a moment when uh, it is clear that demographers tell us within the next 30 years 
the United States will become uh, what's euphemistically known as a majority minority nation. There will be no one single ethnic group in the United States that is the majority. This will be the first time, obviously, in the history of the United States that uh, white that pe people of white European descent will not be the majority in the United States. And um, how do I put this? White people are freaking the fuck out. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's kind of what's happening at the moment. Um, and there is, uh, in, in all sorts of ways, a, a reaction uh, to, uh, to the diminishing of privilege. Uh, and we think of privilege in the sense that um, people who have a lot of power have privilege. In the United States, that's not entirely true. You can be poor, poorer than poor in the United States. But if you have white skin, you have privilege um, in all sorts of different ways. As we've seen in this election, the amount of voter suppression that occurred uh, in, throughout the United States, um, tactically, strategically, was meant to suppress the non-white vote in the United States in places like Georgia, where we now have a situation where it's abundantly clear that the acting attorney general in the state of Georgia, who was running for uh, governor, uh, was, was um, in fact, uh, keeping voting machines from uh, the counties in which uh, largely uh, that, that had majority um, populations of people of color. They just found 180 unwrapped voting machines or wrapped machines that were supposed to go to places like Gwinnett County uh, that were kept uh, in storage so that they could uh, make the lines longer, make it harder for people in those counties to vote. Uh, this is something that happened in a number of places in the United States. All right. I could go on and on about the negative effects. The positive effects, it seems to me, are this when it comes to immigration. The Latino population in the United States, it appears from the most recent, uh, uh, from the best statistics available at the moment, uh, increased the percentage of, of voters, uh, not from a very small 7% to a much larger 14%. Uh, of the eligible voting population for a midterm election. This is different from presidential year when the turnout is much higher, but the last midterm elections, which took place in 2014, only 7% of the Latino population in the United States uh, voted for president. This time around, it was 14%. Sadly, in certain places like Florida, that didn't help <laughs> uh, because there's a very conservative group of Cuban Americans in Florida who came out in large numbers voting for the uh, like in candidates. Indeed. Um, but that is long term. Um, this is a tide uh, in which Donald Trump and his minions and the Republican Party in general, since they have become the party of Donald Trump, um, are, are, are fighting a losing battle with history. Um, they're fighting a losing battle with not only the long arc of history, as Martin. <laughs> King said, they're fighting a losing battle with a short tide of history. Uh, within the next 15 years, um, I could not think of a stupider strategy on the part of the Republican Party than to alienate uh, people of Latin American descent. It's, they are going to be the largest, they are, and they will continue to be the largest growing part of the U.S. population, and it seems a very, very silly game that's being played at the moment. Um, however, a lot of things are happening while white privilege disappears in the United States. The appointment of endless numbers of judges, which is the long-term game that the Republican Party is playing. When you can appoint judges in the United States, you can control what the law says and does. On the positive side, uh, there were a huge number of judges of color who were elected in places where you could actually elect judges in the United States, like Texas. Um, shockingly, there were, I believe, uh, I, I, actually don't know because they didn't have the most up-to-date statistics when I looked today, but the largest number of African-American women <laughs> became judges in the state of Texas in the history of the state. It was, as you'll hear, I'm sure, a great election for women in general, um, but it was a really good election for women of color as well. Um, this is all very encouraging to somebody like me who believes that the only advantage the United States has over any other place on earth is our diversity. Um, it's what has led to the greatest economy in the history of the world after World War II. It's what's led to innovation um, unparalleled in the world. I believe 65 to 70% of the Nobel Prize winners in the United States are immigrants. Um, immigration in the United States breeds in innovation. It breeds 
uh, new ways of thinking about social relations. It breeds new and in innovative ways of uh, doing everything from the arts to the sciences and everything in between. It is the, it, if you're going to make an argument for American exceptionalism, which I won't, uh, but if you were going to make it the only thing that would make any sense to argue uh, is that because the United States has been more open to immigration than any other country in the world, it has uh, produced an astonishing uh, number of, uh, of, of, of firsts, uh, which is what happens in Alexander Hamilton, and then I'm done. Alexander Hamilton, back in the 19th century, when he uh, laid the groundwork for the Industrial Revolution in the United States, right around the corner from where I teach, um, in Patterson, New Jersey, where he built the first industrialized city, um, he, wrote, he wrote in his description of why the National Association of Manufacturers needed to be founded in Patterson, New Jersey, because of the Great Falls uh, in Patterson. He wrote that in order to achieve the Industrial Revolution that the United States needed, uh, it was going to be important to lure as many in immigrants as possible from all over the world to bring the skills that were necessary to make it happen. And in fact, if you uh, happen to walk down the streets of Patterson any time in the 19th century, you were going to bump into uh, a newly minted millionaire who was an immigrant. And it was like Alexander Hamilton's, uh, uh, um, uh, like Lin-Manuel Miranda's version of Alexander Hamilton, uh, this was going to be somebody who uh, didn't have the lineage uh, of the people who came over on the Mayflower, but had the ambition, the grit, and the innovation and skill to do something that had never been done anywhere before. Um, so, that being said, um, Donald Trump's days are numbered. They are demographically. Oh, there's mortality. <laughs> and he will die. <laughs> All right, well, that's some good, uh, good enough to, you know, uh, move on to our next speaker. And maybe we'll revisit, of course, the most uh, notorious piece of uh, media to come out of the American election was one related to uh, immigration. And, and uh, Donald Trump, to a certain extent, uh, staked his entire campaign on the idea that there was an invasion coming from uh, 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 Central America, a caravan. And, an uh, 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 ad that uh, um, even Fox News found too racist to run, shockingly. For those of you, I assume you know what Fox News is. Yes. They thought it was too racist uh, uh, to run. And so immigration was the key issue, not the economy, which is booming in the United States. Um, uh, so uh, we'll revisit uh, some more about immigration. As I said, this will be an ongoing discussion. But now Julie will uh, tell us about all. I, I, I agree with uh, everything you're saying, but have thoughts to add to it that there's a more positive side than even what you're saying based on the midterm elections, which is evidenced by Trump completely freaking out in Paris. Um, but there's also positive vis-a-vis -a, -vis a more ominous sort of Argentine future that, that the United States could face. So let's talk about white panic, okay? And this, in this two-party system, and I'm curious about what you want to talk about, the Electoral College, and um, maybe, I don't know if you're going to, but, and, and the, the paradox of the senatorial structure versus the House of Representatives. So um, with, you know, as the country diversifies, it's also getting more populous. And you're basically having already a problem when you say, you know, the uh, white, white people will be bred out, you know, um, more as a fantasy, even if they become, right now, uh, the rural part of the United States is 30%. And the cities, which are the place of diversity, and those are the coastal cities, those are the blue states, are about 80%. So that's what we're looking at. You know, I'm just always saying to spend a lot of time in Argentina, and I think about like how they even landed up with the dirty wars. It's a complete ignoring of that middle of the country, or they only have like one major metropolis in Buenos Aires, you know, that's European identified. Um, so Trump was activating that 30% that's rural, 
this white panic that actually did not have a voice as, uh, for them to identify openly with neo-Nazism, alt-right, um, heightened misogyny, uh, greed. These are not poor people, no matter what the media says. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the KKK as sort of like this life raft, which actually dovetails with identity politics on the left. And you could already see in the 80s culture war that with identity politics will breed tribalism. That's why Trump's people use things like identitarian, like, you know, they, they, they're using the language of multiculturalism. So the problem that, you know, and, and I've been politically active since I was nine, because this is the people that raised me, right? They moved me to Newport Beach uh, as, and they're left, you know, um, and we figure out rapidly this is a horrible place to be, and they actually put me, um, even before that, like, they had me licking stamps, you know, when I was three. Like, they're like, a monkey can do this, what can you do, right? So by the time I'm nine, I was walking precincts in Newport Beach for McGovern, you know, and when I, you know, you just go hand this, these things out, and like, this is the family religion. Um, and when I come back and I'm like, these doors are being slammed, this is like cold out there, and you know, my father's like, here's more brochures, the universe is a cool place, go to work, right? So when I say that I literally was waiting my whole life for Newport Beach to go blue, it's not hyperbole or a metaphor. But I say this, that some of the thoughts I've been thinking about are informed just almost neurologically growing up in Southern California and being committed to flipping a lot of these districts and knowing that California is now like the, then, is like the country is now. When I grew up, you had two cities, San Francisco and Los Angeles, they would throw down for blue, and then you have the great swath uh, in between it of the Central Valley that looks exactly like the center of the country, and it's untenable. It's untenable. It becomes this, and that's sort of the Argentine thing. Now, I think that the positive, um, is that uh, standing between us and apartheid because it can, we can grow. We can grow California to be, you know, even gayer than it is, you know, and even more diverse. And it's not going to matter because we only get two senators. So people aren't figuring out, you know, this is whole and the electoral college and with the governors being able to do gerrymandering and redistricting. Now, the only thing that stands between us, because we're not going to get rid of the two senators per state thing in my lifetime. Um, we're probably not going to get rid of the electoral college in my lifetime. But what therefore stands between us and apartheid tyranny and, and some sort of you know, democracy that starts like California are women of color, primarily immigrants, particularly, um, now I'm not talking just about Southwest, but you can't, because it's like, um, People who are Native American, people who are lesbians, people who are Somali Americans, people who are Palestinian, these are the women who are winning, but they're winning in majority white, majority red states. And time and again, they go on television and then they have some white person tell them, how did you do that? <laughs> and, and they said, first of all, I grew up there. Basically saying to the media, you're the one who sees me as this other in my community, I'm not really seeing this other because I know what's going on. And number two, they say, well, how do you, how do you, you know, how did you get up? And like, they're like, I'm a woman. You know, the, everything is against me. It didn't occur to me that I would run for something with ease or with a gerrymander. Um, and so from the representatives up through the governorships, right? So you've got people on the ground in the house, then you've got governorships with women who are actually going to stop the gerrymandering. You have infrastructure, and it has to be red states. And I say this as a Californian who lived her whole life to flip a red district. And that's what Katie Porter did, and, 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 and um, what's his name? Harley. You know. So we can talk more about it, but that's my proposition. Wonderful. Well, as you, as you probably know or may know since you're here, the, what essentially happened was that, that the uh, Democrats um, uh, won 30 seats. 
And uh, one of the reasons they only won 30 seats in the House of Representatives is um, what's called gerrymandering, which is very bizarre districts that are, uh, that are drawn specifically so that candidates from your party can win. And the Republicans did the last redistricting, right? And so it became a very difficult map to begin with. And even so, in the House of Representatives, which is the closest to direct democracy, uh, that exists in the United States, the Democratic Party did extraordinarily well. In the Senate, state by state, it varied, and governorships, it varied. But in the House, overwhelmingly, the Democrats, uh, there was a, a profound repudiation of, of Trump in, in the House. Yeah. Um, so Chorus is my alley. Just going off from that idea of gerrymandering, um, what I want to concentrate on is kind of is talking about American democracy as a democracy that's always depended on the suppression of the vote. So American democracy is, is, is started off as a slave-owning democracy, right? And then uh, uh, Rebecca Solnit, if you haven't seen this article that Rebecca Solnit wrote about uh, the Civil War never ended, right? The idea that the core of American society, which is a society that promises democracy, demo uh, promises you know one person, one vote, but at the same time, sort of started off with enslaving a large portion of populations and once freed them, continue to make sure that those people who are free do not vote. That is a fundamental part of American politics. And it is just the past 20, 30 years that we're seeing one party really depending itself more on the suppression of vote than another party. But this is a part of, if you call it Jeffersonian democracy, Jacksonian democracy, FDR, all uh, American elections are about, not about how many votes you can get, but also about how many votes can you make sure the other party doesn't get. Right? So, so this is what, what you have to understand about what's going on in America. And what's interesting about what's happening with these elections in the past like, decade, basically, is the Americanization of democracy across the world. You have now, in Britain, for the first time, with, uh, with um, who was the, the Tory uh, prime minister? Um, Cameron. The, uh, Cameron. Uh, started, started introduced gerrymandering into British politics. First time in, in British history where gerrymandering, the American kind of notion of let's draw districts to help specific candidates win, is now being introduced in, 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 in Britain. In France and Germany, the idea of, of voter ID, the idea that somehow we need to make sure everybody's got an ID because, it's, because people are going to have uh, gonna, uh, vote multiple times, we're going to make sure that doesn't happen, so we're going to make ha ask everyone to have an ID, which automatically makes sure that poor people people who are, who are, for whatever reason, do not have an ID, don't get to vote. So these are all new American notions of democracy that are spreading across other democracies now, and this is something that American sort of ruling class has perfected in the past 200 years of its existence. And that's really the way we need to understand what's going on right now. Um, Americans do not vote, right? Americans have one of the lowest rates of, 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 of voters in the, in the industrial, in, 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 in OECD, the industrialized world. Um, for the past election, the past three elections since Obama, the rate of, uh, of, of voters who can vote um, has, has, has tipped over 50% slightly. But generally, more than half of Americans do not, do, do not bother to vote because of this tradition of suppressing vote and discouraging people to vote. Americans, I think, is the only country that has its voting days on a Tuesday, which is a working yeah. day. So mm -hmm. if you're a working person, you can't actually like, take, take time off to go work. And then when you have long lines, you, you basically can't. Uh, can't vote. I don't think it's any other country in the world in which national voting happens on a day where working people uh, have to go to work. So this is this are all part of what how we have to understand the way that American ruling class runs this democracy. Um, so what was interesting about Obama, was what was important about Obama and why he won was this process by which he brought a large number of new voters into the electoral system. He expanded the base of the Democratic Party. Something like 15 to 20 million more people voted because they voted for Obama, right? So he really expanded the base of Democrats. And as the, the previous speakers uh, talked about, that is freaking out the Republicans, right? Because if the Democrats are expanding their base, the Republicans have to expand their, their base as well. When you're representing a shrinking population, the, the majority white population, you, you don't have that many chances of expanding your base. So there are two ways of going about it. Increasing voter, voter suppression, which is what they've been doing, really, I mean, the, and, and this election really blew the lid off of this, right? You know, we saw over and over again in Georgia, um, in Alabama, in Arkansas, in, 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 in the Dakotas, how 
uh, the sort of the governors and the people who were running elections were using their power to make sure that specific uh, uh, populations who are not going to be Republican don't vote. So, so that was, that's one strategy. That's a gift that keeps on giving in American politics. It's kind of there. It's established. It's systematic. But what the Republicans have, have, have also began to do is to really tap into a portion of the population that, that wasn't voting that is beginning to vote now. They're expanding their base as well, and that is the evangelical, the white, kind of the angry white uh, voters. Basically, these, these folks who are now coming out with their Make America Great uh, Again hats, who generally were not, um, um, they were not a dependable source of votes for, for the Republican Party until this past election. So the, so the Republican Party is expanding their base, tapping into a particular population that, for all intents and purposes, is a very scary portion of American population, right? So they're unleashing a force that they're not going to be able to control, that they're all you can't control, right? It's becoming militarized in the way, in the way that, the, the, that the borders become militarized, and you have these um, kind of uh, civilian kind of uh, paramilitary groups that, that, that have been uh, going to the border for about two decades now to, to defend American borders from the invading uh, Latino hordes, you know, and, and that's becoming that part of standard American politics now. This is a, this is a paramilitary, people call it a neo-fascist kind of like formation that is that's targeting uh, Latino immigrants, but then within cities now, you had in Chicago, in Illinois, in the suburb of Chicago, you had a, a person who said I'm a Nazi, right? Who got what, what, 3,500 votes from a part of of of, of suburb of Chicago that basically is where the, the Chicago police live. So the, the city that Chicago police live voted about 3,500 people voted for someone who said I'm a Nazi. Right? So uh, what is happening within the cities in the United States is a big, bigger polarization between this kind of the, the, the scary kind of like the scared white people who want to, who are don't know what's going to happen to the country because you know they had a black president and all these immigrants are coming and all that language and the way that the, 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 that they're going about it because of the polarized nature of, uh, nature of American uh, urban populations they're, it's, it's becoming it's, it's not only the borders basically becoming into the cities as well. So I'm not as optimistic. I'm not, I'm, I don't want to be as optimistic right now because because what I'm seeing happening with the death with with kind of like the mass shootings that are happening that are racially based, um, that are always class based, um, without increasing, there doesn't seem to be a way of stopping this. They're unleashing a force that I'm not sure if, if they know how to contain. And I think, um, but I want to. I'll end on this. I don't know how long I've spoken for. Um, um, what is sort of, and I want to read. What are, what, are, what, are, yeah, to read. Um, what is important to understand about Democrats and Republicans right now, the Republicans are using the threat of chaos, right? They're saying that if we don't win, um, there's going to be chaos. They, 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 they did this with Gore, the Gore v. Bush election. That was a very important election because that, that was the first election in a while where the Republicans lost the, the popular vote, but they got to win the presidency anyway. They did that because they were really threatening political chaos if, Bush, if, if Gore had not conceded. And he conceded basically to keep the political peace. So Republicans have been doing this, and it's getting worse and worse and worse, right? And that's the that's distinction between the Democrats and Republicans. Republicans want to use chaos, the threat of chaos, political chaos, to get, to, to get what they want, and Democrats continue to give in to them, right? There's this thing called the center that, 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 that the Republicans keep on pushing to the right when it comes to various politics, and Democrats have been following them, saying, okay, fine, uh, we, will, we, uh, we, will, we will agree partly on your, on your agenda around immigration, we'll agree partly on your agenda around, around uh, urban policing. They keep on, they, they keep on conceding to, to the Republican politics. And I think as long as that happens, American politics is going to continue to go in the direction that it is. And I, and I think what part of what, we, what I think Americans have to think about is what does it mean to have alternatives, to have an answer to these questions that people are asking that is not necessarily trying to shadow the Republicans or trying to concede or, 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 or placate the, the Republicans. And that is kind of what I think American politics, progressives and people who are thinking outside of this trajectory are trying to think about. And I think the grassroots politics, and this is the saving grace of American politics, is the strength of grassroots politics, which is very divided right now, which I don't think is coming together. I think Bernie Sanders really did a really good job of sort of giving some shape to it, but it's still nowhere near where it can be to, to provide an alternative to what the Republicans are, are doing. Because them, certainly the, the Democrats are not going to do it. They haven't been, been able to do it, and they're not going to do it. And, and, and these elections, these past elections show that Democrats, at best, can get the fear vote from, 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 them, from uh, voters, but they're not going to be able to offer an alternative to what the Republicans are doing.
Thank you. One of the things that may not, uh, you may not be aware of since you may not have been born uh, is that this election that Corus is talking about, the American presidential election of 2000, pitted uh, Al Gore against George W. Bush. George W. Bush lost the popular vote, uh, which is what happened to Hillary Clinton uh, also in 2016. The key state was the state of Florida. And uh, there was a, a protracted recount of the votes. And then one of the most egregious uh, Supreme Court decisions uh, um, in the United States basically handed the election to George W. Bush. Actually, judges that were appointed by his father were among those who did it. Um, what's going on now um, is... And his brother was the governor. Yes, his brother was the governor of the state of Florida. Thank you. It looks... If you tell the difference between that and Argentina, you win the prize. Um, uh, what you're seeing in Florida now um, is very close elections for both the governor and senator, and um, there are statements that are being made um, coming from the President of the United States and the Republican senatorial candidate, for example, that it's all rigged. Um, this vote counting that's going on, and there are these essentially paramilitary groups going down to protect the vote, right, in Florida. So we are seeing a replay of, of that episode from 2000 um, in the current uh, environment. So uh, a little bit of background for those of you who may not have been around in 2000. Daniel Wright, please. Yes, um, well, um, the United States of America is one of not elected by the majority of its people. So at the 2016 general elections, Hillary Clinton got 3 million more votes than Donald Trump. And the same happened before as in 2000, what you just mentioned, when Al Gore was thinking he would be the next US president by receiving 500,000 more votes than uh, Bush. And uh, the recount in Florida was stopped. And I will uh, come back to Florida because there was a remarkable development at this election in Florida. So what the 2016 presidential election and the election this time for the House of Representatives and Senate have in common that the Democrats won in all cases the popular vote. Uh, for the Senate, uh, the De Democratic Party won 12 million more votes, but the Republicans gained seats. And this has, of course, something to do with uh, the electoral system. The House of Representatives is more democratic than the Senate. In the House of Representatives, with its uh, 435 um, members, uh, states with uh, a larger population have more seats than states with a smaller population. However, in the Senate, every single state has two senators. So, um, California, where Julie is coming from, is the most populous state in the U.S. with 40 million people. It has two senators, and Wyoming and, is And we subsidize, subsidize red states because yes. they can't pay their taxes. And Wyoming, which has 560,000 uh, people, has also two senators. Uh, by coincidence, so California is usually won by the Democratic Party and Wyoming by the Republican Party. So let's assume the rules will not change. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, as uh, Pooh has already said, um, the, the uh, voter turnout in the United States is uh, low uh, in comparison with other developed uh, countries. Um, and um, although it went up by 30% compared with the previous midterm elections, but it's still low if you have in a country of 325 million people, like only 140 million people going. Uh, participating in the elections. Of course, there are a number of, number of structural reasons. Uh, one was mentioned, the elections are taking place on a Tuesday. I read many articles of people were waiting two, three hours in a line on a working day. Um, then uh, another one is that uh, voting rules became key elements of election strategies. So uh, the New York Times quoted today a Stanford University law professor, personally, who said, we've reached a situation in which the fight over the rules and who gets to vote is seen as a leg legitimate part of electoral competition. Okay. So however, uh, restrictions on voting were mainly imposed by Republicans. Um, uh, one, uh, the gerrymandering was mentioned. It's named after a, 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 a governor from Massachusetts in the 19th century, uh, Mr. Gary, who like drew all lines uh, in the state in a way that uh, it would be favorable for his party. This is 
common in the United States, although there are huge differences from state to state. Uh, voter registration in most states, uh, you refer to uh, Germany. I think Germany is very democratic. Uh, I, uh, 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 in Germany, uh, you don't need to register. You just go on voting day or six weeks prior to the voting to the local town hall to vote. Yes, you need to present your ID, but in Germany, everybody has an ID. It's not like in the US where some people do not have an ID. So uh, as a, in, the, in the US, you, voter registration is common, and in most states, voters must register uh, well in advance of an election. For example, 30 days in Arizona. If you miss it, you cannot vote anymore. And what is the, uh, what is the percentage of uh, voters who vote in German elections, say a German national election? Do you know Around what it is? Around 80%. 80% in and Germany. Even state elections and the US is struggling to have 50%. Exactly. So um, then early voting opportunities were restricted in some states. Uh, they were like on college campuses, uh, students fighting for having the opportunity for early voting. Uh, but it was usually like two or three days on, on, on college campuses. Uh, and uh, across the country, nearly 1,000 polling places have been closed uh, for this election compared with previous elections. Then, of course, the structural reason uh, is that it's a winner-take-all electoral system. So and since uh, now we're talking about Germany, uh, in Germany, but many other countries, there's proportional representation. So in Germany, for example, there's a rational of participating in the election and voting for uh, the uh, post-communist party, or for the Green Party, or for the Liberal Party. In the US, if you have sympathy with the Green Party or the Libertarian Party, why going to the election? You know your, the vote is like a wasted vote, because anyway, it will make one of the two big parties will make it. So uh, the major, majoritarian system, of course, discourages people from participating in the election. Then I think another point that is interesting and important um, <clears throat> is uh, who is the vote eligible population? Of course, we can look far back in history. Women were not allowed to vote before 1920. African Americans were not allowed to vote in all states before 1960. But even today, there are still millions of people excluded from the elections. So for example, uh, namely, in many states, uh, felons and ex-felons cannot vote. And um, so there are around 6 million people who cannot participate in, in uh, elections in the United States because they used to be in prison or are in prison. And there is, of course, a racial bias because one third of them are African Americans. So now, one of the most remarkable outcomes of this election is uh, a referendum in Florida. Um, where people uh, voted to restore the rights to vote for felons and ex felons just with very few exceptions of if one was sentenced because of murder or a sexual um, assault. But it's relevant because this is a battleground state, Florida. And um, so a few thousand uh, uh, votes made the difference in 2000, for example. In Florida, so far, 9% of the population could not participate in the elections. 1.4 million people, imagine. Because they were, for minor reasons, maybe a sentence. So now, uh, a surprisingly large majority of 65% of the people in Florida voted to restore rights to vote in Florida. So I think this is remarkable. And since US elections are boring, because in most, elections, in most states, we know what is happening. It's just about the battlegrounds, the swing states, and Florida is one of them. So maybe this will change the dynamics in future elections. I would like to make a final remark. Now the common argument, like all over the press, is that there is a gridlock coming up um, in US politics. And I would like to, to argue the opposite. I would say there won't be a gridlock. Yes, there will be on the federal level. But don't forget, the US is federalism. So mm -hmm. the states have unmatched power. Uh, even much more than other federal countries such as Brazil or Germany. So let's have a look at what, ha what happened in the states. Let's have a look at the 50 states. There's only one of the 50 states left uh, where the cham state chamber is divided, which is Minnesota. In all other states, uh, both state house and state senate is either both with the Republican Party or both with the Democratic Party. So. And then if we include in the analysis also like uh, the governor, uh, who, 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 which party has the governor. So now we have 14 states where the Democratic Party is controlling uh, the uh, two chambers of the state plus a governor. 
And we have 20 states where the Republicans have uh, controlled both chambers plus the governor. So what is happening is that uh, blue states will become more blue and red states will become more red. Uh, and this, uh, uh, this uh, applies to uh, what we discussed on voter suppression because the next census is coming up in 2020. In 2021, the rules will be made uh, 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 on uh, uh, electoral rules, uh, so uh, uh, although there are differences uh, in the states, but uh, I mean the gerrymandering uh, 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 is continued to happening. So both parties will make sure to to have rules that make sure that their parties continue to win the state. But uh, not only I mean uh, the strategic issue. So of course Republicans will use uh, as the states they dominate as a laboratory to implement their policies, and the same the Democratic Party will do. So I think the uh, sub-national uh, level will become more important in the United States. There will be a gridlock on the national level, yes, but we will see many democratic policies being implemented on the state level and many republican policies being implemented on the state levels in the years to come. Thank you. And we've seen it with Jerry Brown in California and the uh, Democratic Party controlling the state of California. There is, uh, you see, the U.S. going this way and California yeah. going another Kind-y way. Um, uh, all right, Karim. Uh, well, if you think you heard bad news here, you've I mean, <laughs> 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 the best to us. So <laughs> please, nobody think there's going to be any optimistic ending on, on this panel. Uh, so maybe we should have started this way. And maybe and we could have ended well, this is not Hollywood. Uh, We're not you know, expecting a happy ending. <laughs> I mean, it, it, what's interesting just to start with is, is uh, during the initial election where Trump won, there was a whole discussion about how it is that maybe you know, Hillary would be more uh, interventionist, she'd be more bellicose, and Trump you know, would be focused more on national issues. And this is, you know, this is now debatable, it's arguable. Who knows what Hillary would have done? I'm sure she would have been very interventionist. But we've seen that Trump has actually made things very, very uncomfortable, certainly for the, in the Middle East. And, and more than anything else, what I can't forgive him is in uh, having us all feel nostalgic about George Bush Jr. Yeah. <laughs> and his, uh, his business where he's a painter and he's lost his hair and he's smiling and he's passing chewing gum to, to Michelle Obama and we're supposed to feel great about this. Oh, look at the nice guy, he passes chewing gum and Michelle Obama, who's a great person, is accepting it and they're smiling and they're holding hands. And I, I don't know, I feel... It is revolting. It's, yeah. it's very it's strange to, to think about this kind of thing. Uh, and the third point, just very generally, is that we've, we've gone to a point where it's difficult to think foreign policy-wise, uh, which is very different than, than what we were talking about domestically, which is there's not necessarily any ideology that's, that's, that we can think of that's very specific. It's not a hardcore realist agenda or a hardcore neocon agenda. It's, 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 there are particular personalized things that, that I'll try to talk about a little bit here. Well, we can, we can think about it. Um, so Trump, so far, in terms of what he's done, um, I mean, there's a whole list of things. I mean, of course, the Iran nuclear deal came and he removed the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, he's moved the embassy to Jerusalem, very controversial, big issue, obviously, here. Um, he's defunded UNRWA, the Palestine Refugee Agency, and that's, that's huge. I mean, it didn't get as much attention as the Jerusalem issue, maybe for obvious reasons, but it's had a huge actual impact on, on, on people in, uh, in all the Palestine refugee camps, including in Gaza. People forget that in Gaza, 70% of the population are refugees. Uh, so it, it's, this, it's, and it was very punitive, and it was done very last second, it was done, I'm just gonna pull out the money now, not okay, in a couple of years, we're gonna start lowering it. Right now, we'll start defunding immediately. Uh, he's obviously supported Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia and the Yemen war, uh, and huge weapon sales, although Obama has done a huge amount of weapon sales as well previously, so that really hasn't changed that much. Um, and then there's this business of the deal of the century that he's been pushing, and nobody really knows what it is because it's like this thing that they keep threatening and it hasn't yet come out. But I think from, you know, it seems pretty obvious that it's about one of the packages aside from removing this question of Palestine refugees and making sure that's no longer, that there's no longer a right of return and Jerusalem has been moved out, is the full normalization, trying to get the Arab countries, especially the Gulf countries, to sign an overarching normalization kind of pact with the Israelis and then everybody gets to focus on Iran and that's the, that's the big issue. I think it's a pipe dream, it's not gonna happen, but it doesn't mean that they're not gonna try doing this, uh, especially now with, with uh, Saudi Arabia and maybe the Emirates and Oman and other places like this. Uh, so, 
I, I mean, there's a long story. We can give a whole. We can talk maybe more discussion about the continuity. So this is what what Trump has been doing. But the continuity with the past. I don't think this is necessarily this massive rupture. I don't think that what Obama was doing before that and what the Democrats were doing before that, and certainly Bush before that, it signals this massive change in the Middle East. There's still the same sets of issues that are controlled and the same set of, for domestic reasons and other kinds of reasons, uh, which, which remain. There's a lot of consistent things. It's just more personalized. It's less, uh, it, it, it has less of a liberal veneer. There's less of a pretense of diplomacy. And kind of you know let's let's be careful about it's okay to bomb Gaza but you know let's let's be careful not to show pictures of uh, people dying. Now this particular discussion doesn't care if, if people are dying or not in Yemen and other places. So the, the style has changed. I'm not sure about the substance too much. Uh, in terms of the midterm elections, well I think I mean it's interesting to think about that while there might be I don't know there might be a little bit more gridlock in in Congress. Uh, it means that maybe we might turn more to foreign policy. I think Trump might actually push foreign policy more because things, legislation might not pass quite as much in Congress, on the, at least on the federal level. Uh, I think this is something to look out for, and especially with all the executive powers that, that Trump has now, partly thanks to Obama, with all the executive orders where the president can push things on the foreign realm that he can't necessarily do on the domestic side. I think this is something to look, uh, to, to look at and might actually increase what he's going to be doing in the Middle East and outside. I also think that with the, I mean, nobody mentioned the Mueller investigation or the impact of that, but I think as that, if it proceeds as we, as it might, then this business of having some kind of pretext, creating some kind of diversion, a crisis, especially abroad, might make it even worse for the Middle East, possibly. I think this question of creating crisis and diversion, as the investigation comes closer and closer, is something we also need to be I think taking very, very seriously. Uh, I, I, you know, in terms of the Democrats taking over the, the House, would, what would change maybe a bit in Yemen? Because this has been, although Obama is the one who began the support for the, uh, for the Saudi war in Yemen, I think now it's been associated much more with Trump, and so therefore there's this, this and it's become, you know, they can play on the humanitarian side and saying this is getting out of control and put it onto Trump, really forgetting that Obama was the one that began this Yemen war. Uh, so this might at least be, be brought up in a more serious way. The question of the relationship with Saudi Arabia will be brought up because, again, it's as though the Saudi relationship began with Trump, and of course it has a whole history of relations between the US and Saudi Arabia. Uh, and Obama, as I said, was one of the biggest sold among the most arms uh, to Saudi Arabia and the Gulf of any other U.S. administration. So, again, that's something which which remains in place. Um, I think this, if if you look at who becomes the new chair of the House of Foreign Affairs in the Congress, then look into it. It's a guy called Elliot Engel, who's a who's a Democratic congressman from New York. And uh, as far as the Middle East is concerned, this guy is a disaster. So if I if I, I mean if you go through his record, uh, he Obviously, obviously opposed the Obama nuclear deal, 2015. He was a strong supporter of the Bush 2003 war in Iraq, very strong supporter. Uh, he strongly supported the embassy move to Jerusalem. Uh, he's attacked on every occasion the United Nations, the World Court, uh, even the European Union on anything to do with bringing up Palestine, etc., etc. Very strong supporter of the Gaza wars um, and, and the Israeli right to self-defense under any circumstance. He's called even, uh, even kind of democratic support for general democratic to support for Palestinian statehood, such as it is. He's even called that preposterous. Uh, he's opposed any kind of uh, UN role for the Middle East peace process. He's obviously uh, extremely anti Hezbollah, very pro sanctions, and wants to put more and more pressure on terrorists such as Hezbollah and Hamas as they see terrorists. So I don't see any let up on that. In fact, I see, since he's also from New York, I don't see, you know, in sort of you know, domestic pressures and other kinds of pressures, I think this will just remain the same. So a little bit in Yemen might improve, but in terms of the Middle East, it's just, I think, going to get, uh, when we go from, from bad to worse, if anything else. So between trying to create a crisis, between the Democratic Party, uh, between this guy Engel, holding on to this uh, chair and this committee, I don't see much change, unfortunately, here. And on those two issues, again, on Shorty and uh, 
uh, whether or not uh, the Democrats will well, let Trump off the hook and yeah. on the Iran deal, which seems a very substantive sort of shift. I mean, yes, there's you know sort of a, a sort of nauseating uh, continuity in American foreign policy, but the Iran deal to yeah. uh, is a, a, a great uh, rupture or whatever. And as to whether will there be any revisiting. Uh, it by the Democrats, or it's uh, seen as a fait accompli? Uh. I think, I mean, I, I do think that, that if there's one thing that the Obama foreign policy was, was the question of Iran nuclear deal. I think that was a, actually, I think it was a pretty incredible deal that was negotiated, and uh, really probably the, the height of any of the policies that he did. And that's, of course, the first thing that, that Trump targeted, uh, again, for various domestic reasons, as well as his own need to kind of take out whatever Obama did to kind of to remove that. But there's also a lot of domestic pressures that uh, make Iran the, the first thing with Hezbollah, to make them first on, in the crosshairs of any kind of foreign policy. I don't see the Democrats trying to change that too much. They might soften the tone a little bit, but I don't think they can get a nuclear deal going right now at this point. Maybe in the next elections if something happens, but not, I don't think anytime soon they don't want to be seen as soft on the, on the Iran front. The, the thing of Khashoggi is very interesting. I, I, I think it's, it, it tells us a lot about what the Democrats are doing, which is that you have this incredible attention on uh, Khashoggi, who was basically a, who was at that point became a pundit in DC circles, and so one of us in the kind of DC circles. And the, the, this incredible reaction to, to what is an unbelievable and heinous uh, uh, murder, I mean, it's, 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 it's really something else. But this kind of focus on one person's death, as though this was a trigger for Democrats and others to come out and, 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 and you know, cry wolf on this thing. And the other, on the other side of this is the Yemen war, which the Democrats were supporting. There's the question of Gaza wars, which the Democrats supported. All of this was okay, but you can't kill one of ours. So, I mean, it's this liberal veneer that comes, you know, this kind of slightly humanitarian, slightly liberal veneer, but it hides very similar kinds of substantive policies that both the Democrats and Republicans seem to have, at least when it comes to the Middle East. I want to, I want to push one thing that you began with, which is the, the relative lack of coherence in Trump's foreign policy. And first of all, I don't believe Trump understands the rest of the world well enough to have a coherent foreign policy. But I think it's the same as with his domestic policy, which seems to me relatively incoherent, except for this kind of constant drumbeat of white nationalism. I think his foreign policy is incoherent, except for this constant drumbeat of Zionism. And I think that that comes from a very particular reason. It's not his love of the Jews. Um, no, no, to be very clear. Not. Uh, it's not his love of his son-in-law. It's, it, 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 he, he's lost the, um, the funding base, the, public and funding base that has been in place really since the Reagan years, uh, which is the Koch brothers and a certain uh, a set of very uh, well-endowed, uh, let me pull that back, a set of, a set of, a set of very wealthy billionaire Republican money bundlers who had brought together lots and lots of money to support conservative candidates in the U.S. Trump has lost the Koch brothers, which was are kind of the best known of these groups, uh, who shockingly are now putting a bunch of money into supporting candidates who support DACA and who support um, immigration reform, which are obviously the very, uh, very much in contradistinction to, to Trump's approach. Trump's substitute for the Koch brothers is Sheldon Adelstein yeah. and a series of and Zionist Mercers. investors and the, Mercers. and the Mercers who, again, believe that. Uh, whether they happen to be Jewish or whether they happen to be Christian, they, they believe that their home is Jerusalem, and it's rightfully theirs, and Jerusalem has in fact become a way of, of uniting these two strains of, um, uh, of, of dark money uh, religious uh, support. And so I think again, the seeming incoherence, and it's always been true with, Mon with Trump, the only things that have ever sort of, in, in Trump's entire career in real estate, the only things he's ever cared about are where does the money come from? Uh, and how do I keep my privilege, which is connected to his skin color and his race? So that's been true for Trump from day one. I don't think it's changed since he's become president. Yeah, now Bill had a question. Yeah, uh, I've been 
observing and listening to all of you as an Arab looking this And I know that. Uh, Can you hear back Italian there? Can you hear Nabil's question? More no. With a liberal outlook to the situation in the United States. And I see that we have missed at least two important variables in your discussion. One is the Christian fundamentals. You have not mentioned the Christian fundamentals. Second, you have not mentioned the party structure, the Democratic and the Republican party structure, where the kind of candidates that are run, like you have a choice between a crook and, 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 and a stupid person. You have to elect one of these. You don't have really a real choice. So, you know, Christian fundamentalist, as, as a Palestinian here and person who has been following this, I have a niece who's probably a Palestinian. She's married to a Christian fundamentalist priest. So I get to regularly her <laughs> Facebook notes and uh, she and her friends. And I really see that it's a very important group there. And this, this niece of mine is Palestinian, yet she is adamantly so much for Trump and her messages, her children's messages are all for Trump. Yeah. You see how much they are indoctrinated. I mean, yes, the, the, you know, you talk much about the whites and the, the color, but that's, that's, that's a, you know, that's a point of view that liberals focus on. You have, I think, there are more, you have ignored the importance of Christian fundamentalism. You have also ignored the importance of the, the oligarchy in both the, 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 the Republican and the Democratic Party, where they force on you candidates that you know are, are determined well, by... Well, but the midterms, you know, in the House is what I'm I sorry, uh, just for those of you back here, uh, Christian fundamentalism, uh, we hadn't talked about uh, until this moment. Forgive me for interrupting. It has nothing to do with fun. <laughs> fundamentalism. Um, yeah, the white evangelists as well, so there's related. But uh, the, the women, which is the majority of who won, who flipped this in the House, was focusing on the House, which is, you know, really, if you, if you only got to have one thing, you wanted the House because of all the committees and everything everybody's saying here, those were intelligent choices. I mean, this was the point, is that it wasn't between a stupid person and a crook. And basically, it wasn't between religious fundamentalism or not. It was a complete lack of tribalism, which is what's, what's not to be optimistic, but just to be factual. Okay? I, I have to apologize. I don't want to hurt you. So, <laughs> but but the, in other words, the, the identification that you know, is, is breeding and the categorization from which tribalism was being bred before Trump, who's a symptom of this and rides it because he's just a brander. I mean, this is no business to be in politics, right? So the, the, politics will offer you, as everybody's intelligently talked about, a different kind of tribalism. So what interested me about the women was not that they were per se women, but the tenacity that women had to not be interested in, to not be dissuaded by the impossibility of their entering into these red state elections, defying the tribal law of the land that you're talking about. And the second thing I would say is that I would say that issues of race is completely bound up with the Christian fundamentalists. I don't think it's, I think that it's triangular. Yeah. And yeah, so why don't you say something about that? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, for, for many years now, the analysis of American politics is that American politics has gotten tribal. I, I, I think that's a cover for racial. I, mean, yeah. I really do. I, I, and in, in the same way that, that the American political <laughs> media plays, pays a lot of attention to Christian evangelicals and fundamentalism and how big a role that plays in the election, to a certain degree, I think it's, it's a cover for, for race because the evangelicals are white and they are a part of white America that is totally seeing their, uh, their privilege, their access to power dwindle. Um, and it's an access to power that they haven't had for years and years. It's not like they've always had it. This came very much from 
the 1970s is, is where Christian evangelicals in the United States began to organize. And they were organized around very specific uh, uh, races, and then they organized around a president. And Reagan was the first president that they organized around successfully. And people uh, uh, who figured out um, how to activate a certain segment of the American population were activating a segment of the American population that was terrified by the gains that had made, been made by African Americans, by Latinos, by immigrants. It was very much a race-based cry. Back then, there was the dog whistle, right? You didn't actually say well, out loud, you know, uh, what, what, what was said out loud in the ad that, that ran on Sunday night in the United States only once, by, by the way. In fairness to my country, uh, that ad was allowed to run once before the outrage was so great that it was pulled. And as has been mentioned, even Fox News wouldn't run this ad. It was so egregiously ra racist. Um, and I actually believe the, Christian, the, the, the power of the Christian evangelicals in the United States is dwindling. Um, I don't think it's on the rise or is experiencing it's experiencing anything. It's not enough. Uh, Chorus had a comment and then, uh, I'm sorry, I interrupted you again. No. Please, why did you leave? Should I talk to Mark or will you leave with the... No, no, no. no, no. no, no. Um, just to follow on, on, on what, what you were saying and just to go back to Nelly's point, I grew up in the South, in, the, in, Me in Memphis, Tennessee, which is sort of part of, of the uh, United States South. And I went to schools where you know, we had Bible study, and you know, I, I was I was kind of I, I, I got familiar with American Christianity uh, quite closely. This idea that white evangelicalism and Christian right is kind of very much intricately tied to, to race is really important. Um, there is this notion of so this, this specific brand of American Protestantism that really sees itself as the chosen people, right? right? And, and 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 the idea that somehow this this philanderer, you know. Uh, becoming the, the president is fully with, within this idea that you know a sinner can can carry out uh, the work of God uh, just as much as a you know a, a, a religious person can, and and usually it's actually the sinner God God working in mysterious ways work, works uh, through the sinner, and and that's who Trump is. I mean, I, I kind of know people who have no problem with with this man's ethics. Because he's playing a high role, and what is and what is God? God is, is what's good for white people, right? I mean, that is really logic of, of, of a very small percentage of American people. But this is the important part of, of, of American uh, uh, politics. There are a small number of American people, but because of the way this country runs on uh, runs on gerrymandering and all these processes, they get a lot bigger voice, right? Because uh, and, 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 the, and you know, and the people who kind of uh, are, are, are doing their other four strategies know how to give like this five, ten percent of the U.S. population a lot bigger voice than it actually has. And I don't think there's any, necessarily any reason why that's going to change anytime soon. The American, the, the American political system, through their political college system, through gerrymandering, through all these ways, it it makes sure that the, that the people who know how to work it are the ones who who remain in power, and that is white people, and, and the ideology of white people right now is becoming more and more a, a Christian, right? And I, I think giving that up is going to be very hard for them. But I, I want to just make one caveat to my comments, and again, women are central here, not just for the Democrats, and that's why I said Democratic women of color, because the Southern strategy is something that is white and female, and religious, the, the evangelicals. You know, it's after Reconstruction, right? After the Civil American Civil War, and that's where all the stuff about Charlottesville started because they wanted to have the Confederacy statues removed, and they were erected in the early 20th century where white evangelical Christians in the South were putting up those statues in alliance with the KKK, and the KKK at that time had like, you know, it was like a garden variety kind of thing. Later, all of that goes underground, KKK bad, right, as, as, as the Civil Rights Act, but the connection was always there. What Trump did was he made it okay to say that and actually became kind of like a daughter of the Confederacy. And when they talk about 53% of white women voting for Trump, now in this election, they didn't as much. So we peeled some of them off. But to not essentialize 
I don't want to essentialize that women in America are the future, but women in America is somebody's future. <laughs> and, and, and you cannot, no one can win without closing the gender gap. I agree about the yes. woman, but do you have figures about the composition of active women in America? Yes. I, 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 my guess is that there are none, white, and immigrants. So I, I, I have, I have figures. I have figures by active women? <laughs> yes, active I, I, I've seen, for instance, the list of those who got the woman who got selected. I see a Somalian, I see a Palestinian, yes. I see a number of immigrants. Education and, is and key. Education is key. If you are a woman of color, and this is Nate Silver, I mean 538 has the statistics. Um, if you are, so when they say that there was this gender gap between the Republicans and, and the Democrats and those who won, it's not just women of color, it's educated women. And so race and class, again, you can't take it out of it. In the, in the same way with religion, that's all I'm saying. And that, again, I just want to underscore, there are more women in, in, in America than men. And so no one can, this is the card that, that, that is being played. And you saw Trump have more women last time. And what's <coughs> interesting is to see that it's educated immigrant, refugee sometimes, non-Christian, right? People who are actually in red states. So there's a crack in the tribalism because Trump isn't even, he isn't being tribal now, he's initiating tribalism, he's benefiting from it, but he's just for oligarchs that'll give him a hotel, you know? And he's, he was living off of his father the whole time, he's never made a dollar. So there's just this very productive noise that happened that was going on, Indivisible was key, you know, this group that was going into these. This was just people diligently going into communities running where they had no business on the larger scenario. Okay, something happened. Cannot ignore we don't know what's going to happen next. Cannot ignore the wasp woman. You can you never see, ignore the wasp woman. Trump talking with so many women around. Can you well, open one up thing is, can you open up yeah. students? Yeah. I, I, I'd like to. Yeah, yeah. Students and part I mean, do you mind going? Just, uh, seriously, I, I think it's important for us to be in dialogue with most of you, know, you guys. So. Yeah, um, uh, Greg has a question. Ryan uh, had a question. and uh, You had a question? Yeah, yeah please. And then Greg. Um, yeah, I mean. And speak uh, loudly so the people in the back can hear. So that uh, we don't leave you know, today's talk without talking a little bit about if this was an indicator this midterm election was an indicator of what's going to happen in the future. Uh, and there was kind of contradictory messages, whether on the local politics or internationally. Yeah. And, uh, and I heard this, uh, Linda Sarsour, who is a political activist, was on Democracy Now! talking about the fact that most people that voted for Democrats do it as a result of harm reduction, as opposed to, you know, really going out there and voting for Democrats around the local issues, and I think that's what happened this time. Despite what Robert had mentioned was this overwhelming, not overwhelming, but the switch of Congress by about 30 seats or whatever, and that the Democrats are now uh, in charge of the House of Representatives. But that in reality, that maybe the Democrats cannot win from the center in a general election, in a presidential election. So the Democrats, since Clinton, have been you know, the middle party, the moderate party, but they just run from the center. And now that uh, Trump has created this massive right base, you know, or strong, it's not massive, well, it's massive, it's strong, and it's mobilized, I guess, uh, that the left or the Democrats would have to create a counterbalance to that that is a, a base on the left. Uh, and not just anti-Trump to Trump, Trumpism. So it's, it can't be just I'm against Trump because that's not going to do it in the elections uh, for the presidential elections. And so, so and that that's, that's kind of how the locals won. I mean, I agree. I mean, when you when you talk to them after they won, they said we were talking about these very specific issues that were local. They didn't talk about Trump and they didn't talk about Russia. Right. So, but can the Democrats then win? And then the other question that's connected to some of the things that uh, actually Linda Sarsour brought up was the fact that the Democrats have to come up with a 
uh, alternative foreign policy. Does foreign policy really matter? I, and that's the question for, for Karim as far as the next election. So is there a diversity in uh, foreign policy between Democrats and Republicans? It's, it, it seems that there wouldn't be. I mean, uh, George Bush Sr. Uh, supposedly won a war, you know, the, the first desert storm, Iraq war, and lost the election, and then the other guy, you know, George Jr., George Bush Jr., ended up invading Iraq and not doing so well, and then got reelected. I mean, unless that's an indicator of something as foreign policy, I don't think it's very clear whether foreign policy actually counts or the local politics count more. Okay, so there seem like two questions. One is foreign policy, you know, uh, is will there actually be this, you know, ramification? The other thing is the extent to which um, this election is an indicator of what may happen in the future. There was, there were some really encouraging signs in Pennsylvania, in, in Michigan, Scott Walker was defeated in uh, Wisconsin, Ohio, which is a very key state because of course, the American system for presidential elections is electoral. So between Florida and Ohio, for example, these are two states that look like they, they look like they may still remain in the Trump camp. Uh, Colorado elected a, a gay governor, which is a, 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 a quite an extraordinary occurrence. Uh, it looks like that the uh, Democrat who's a female has won and that Arizona may now be in play and there'll be Nevada too is the defeat of a Republican. So domestically, it's a kind of mixed bag for the future. Um, uh, I'd love to hear what others have to say with that about that, but uh, certainly does it matter? Is there any pushback from the left? Ben Rhodes, who was Obama's advisor, was interviewed in The Nation saying uh, when it came to uh, the Iran deal or whatever, nobody had our back. You know, you have like a, a huge Zionist lobby. You pay a terrible political price in the U.S. Um, uh, if you... Um, uh, uh, the resistance that was supposed to have happened with the, with the mass you know, protests and movements right after the Trump election that was promised. Is this the result of this thing, or is there something else that's at play? Well, the indivisible is actually responsible for yeah. all of those red state representation flipping it. Like, and they were doing, th another horrible district was uh, Daryl Issa. Um, yeah. So, and he was the one who was just, you know, I am going to have Obama arrested. That's all of Americans. America. Yes. yes. Yeah, it's very, very proud. So indivisible started the day after Trump was elected, and it was a lot of old Obama people who were just processing their melancholia because they were like, we've worked eight years, not on successfully about what you're talking about, but some civil rights stuff, right, domestically. And so they were just, they took their model as the Tea Party. So it was the, 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 the left, center to less version of it. And they were just systematically going to various districts and building infrastructure because the move to the center politics that we're talking about, that the Clintons always uh, did, they, you just write off large swaths of the, uh, you don't run a 50 state um, campaign. So one of the interesting things they would do is they would throw retirement parties. So they did it with their license, and they just get people, and these are just like old, fuddy-duddy white people that are just political, right? And there are maybe 30 of them at, at any given place, and so they would throw retirement parties, and they would keep because representatives are really sensitive about people showing up, because it's every two years they have to run. So if they can get 10 phone calls, they're like wetting their pants. So they would go and go outside of their office and sing retirement songs and bake them cakes and just humiliate them. And like 30, they got 30. Part of the reason we have these seats is that indivisible forced them to retire, because it's really hard to run against an incumbent. So the Lebanese can run, you know, has, uh, anybody who doesn't have this massive infrastructure, you, you know, you don't want to run, you want to run against somebody who's also not been there. And so that's what Indivisible does. It's really unsexy, it's not people wearing pussy pink hats, it's not mass protest, it's just, it's, a, it, it, it's like political virology that has a viral model. I mean, I, I... It may surprise you to hear I'm actually much more optimistic uh, after this election than, than I uh, was before. Not because I think there's been a sea change in American politics in terms of 
uh, uh, power state to state, but because the people who were elected, uh, the people who were new, the, who ran for the first time, are by far a more representative group of Americans than I've ever seen in political office in the United States. Uh, will they be better uh, at the sort of business of politics? Uh, we'll see, but they're certainly more representative of the, of the people in the United States. I think there is a, ge a, ge a generation gap uh, where we do have an opportunity at this moment um, to break out of a mold that, um, for me, begins with the Reagan years. I, I think we're still living in the Reagan moment. Um, I, I did a lot of research when I wrote my book on Reagan, and one of the things that became very clear to me is that Reagan was the sea change, right? I mean, that's, that's the moment at which American <coughs> politics turned into something su substantively different. One of the interesting things about this election is, despite the fact that we still have a pitiful turnout of voters compared to Germany and other industrialized nations, this was actually the largest turnout in a yeah. midterm election since Watergate. Which in 104 years, I just said this morning. They no, it's Watergate, because I just, well, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's a huge <laughs> turnout by American standards, which is pitiful, but it is, it, it does signal something. Um, and I do think that the decision of the people uh, who, 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 who ran this time around is owed uh, almost entirely to the presence of Donald Trump. Um, and as much as Indivisible was responsible for getting some of the incumbent Republicans and Democrats who were more, more on the right to step down, Donald Trump was also responsible yes. for getting them to step down because some of them just couldn't stomach him anymore. Jeff Flake in Arizona, folks like that. So I think that Long term for me, I'm optimistic that Donald Trump is exactly what, what is needed to push the United States to a different place politically. That is, by bringing out into the open the last gasp of white privilege, by bringing out into the open the last gasp, I think, of a certain kind of money privilege in politics, there is the possibility that we can establish a new paradigm. And I do think that for me, it's about breaking out of the Reagan paradigm, which again, I, for me, it comes back to race at some level, because the Southern strategy is actually something that started during the Reagan years. And the idea was that you could peel off um, white ethnic and white middle class, blue collar voters, union voters in the, in the industrial rust, rust Belt in the United States, and among the Southern uh, uh, states. You could peel off what had been traditionally very, very reliable De democratic voters by basically saying we are the party who is going to keep the darker hordes from overtaking the country and it worked it worked very well and uh, the commercial that Robert mentioned uh, that aired on, on Sunday night reminded uh, both of us actually of a commercial that ran during the Bush years which directly came out of the Southern strategy game plan which was the Willie Horton yep. commercial, which was basically go. saying, if you vote for Michael Dukakis for president of the United States, um, you, better, you better hide your white women because these black felons are going to come and rape them. And this was basically the, and again, it goes back to the idea, it's an evangelical idea, it goes back even before then to the idea that it's white men must protect white women from the, from the, you know, savage redskins initially, and then from, from slaves and others, and then from, I mean, it goes on and on, and it's an incredibly potent fantasy uh, for pulling out white voters um, to vote in a particular and he, he, Trump was campaigning that way. He, you know, about all the black candidates say, white women, you know, they don't like this, you know, and neither do white men, you know, and any of the... I mean, one of the big issues was this thousands of people from Central America which yeah. uh, marched uh, towards the United States. And I mean, Trump is very good in like uh, uh, putting fear to people's mind and uh, uh, giving the impression that this would be a relevant issue, which it is not. Uh, there are other much more relevant issues. And I like your reference to Ronald Reagan because Trump has done something very similar with uh, the tax reform, which was uh, uh, implemented in December 2017. Uh, um, usually cutting taxes is something one is doing in times of economic crisis. There is no economic crisis. There is a low unemployment rate, there is high economic growth. So this tax cuts make zero sense. Um, they are just benefiting uh, big corporations and wealthy people. 
Um, and uh, these tax cuts will produce uh, an uh, uh, increasing debt, and this is one of the major issues. Uh, nobody discusses uh, the debt of the United States. That's one of the major issues. And uh, increasing inequality, of course. So uh, Trump is very good in distracting from the real problems and in uh, 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 putting fear in people's minds uh, rather than discussing the real issues. So uh, Karim was actually going to also address, I think it's a key question, is the extent to which um, there, it, it, it matters even on the margins, uh, American foreign policy and especially how it affects this part of the world, yeah. which party is in power? Uh, I mean, you, you mentioned Ben Rhodes and in his recent memoir, it's interesting if you, if you look at it, especially the parts about the Middle East, you'll see that actually the, the debates between the Democrats or that kind of Democrat and the Republicans as now the evangelicals, it sort of mirrors the Likudist versus the Labour Party type yeah. politics. Yeah. It's a domestic, it's a domestic style thing. Mm -hmm. And what you what you end up with is competing versions of Zionism. So in one sense, the the kind of what Obama was trying to do and what John Kerry was doing it towards the end was to say, let us save Israel, let us have proper Zionism work. It, to do that, as what the Labour Party is doing, what Omar did, what, uh, what you know, the kind of Labour Party leaders are trying to talk about, is to say, let us, we have to cut off the West Bank, we have to, or at least parts of the West Bank, we have to cut off Gaza Strip, and we need to, at some point, think about the demographic problem, uh, and that's what's going to save Zionism, that's what's going to save Israel and its Jewish identity, etc. The evangelicals are only saying, no, there's still this land run. We can still work on an ethnic cleansing model, we can still push them as far as possible. We can still just pretend they don't exist and, and work on an ethnic cleansing kind of model. Both of these, so these are mirroring Israeli domestic politics and the kind of thing. So I don't see, in terms of the overall structure, I don't think see very much changing. And if you read what Ben Rhodes is saying, he makes a, a point over and over and over that Obama is the most Zionist president that America has ever had. Now, we can debate, I mean, with Ronald Reagan, other, we, you know, we can debate this, but so he's saying Stiff that, competition. Stiff competition. He's saying that, he says that Obama tells him that in his heart of hearts, he's just, he's Jewish inside, that Obama himself is Jewish. This is in, in the memoirs themselves. So I don't see that there's going to be, that there's this massive di uh, difference when it comes to the Middle East, at least this part of the Middle East. I think it's, it's quite similar. I don't see that, that uh, ultimately... Do you see somebody revisiting the Iran deal, for example? What about the relationship yeah, with Saudi? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. They seem like they could... As you know, they're much together. more likely yeah. to I think have, uh, be different. Under as ways to, get, as ways to get at Trump. There's going to be, I think, the question of Yemen might be one thing which is going to happen. I think Yemen is going to start to start to dwindle a little bit, start to get a little bit... They're going to finally come up with a political solution sooner or later. Uh, I think that might happen in the coming months. I hope that might happen in the coming months. Did you uh, see these Rick Tyler photographs in the New York Times? They were really quite, you know, it's, you know, I mean, the war has been going on now for what, like three and a half years or whatever, but uh, the New York Times had these very, very graphic photographs, uh, you know, top of the page with video or whatever this uh, photographer Rick Tyler did. and. Uh, uh, there were all these comments from them as if it had happened now. You know, it's all now we're aware of this uh, kind of hideous uh, war that's been going on. I just want to, I just want to say though, um, I think looking at the future of, of the American foreign policy, especially specifically with the Middle East, I don't think, I don't think that what we what we have to look at is what's going to happen in the U.S. Whether Democrats are going to sort of push it back to this way or that way. I think the factor in the Middle East is is, is people in the Middle East. You know, what I mean, I think I mean the, the Israeli kind of foreign foreign legion was all in Oman in the past couple of weeks. Did y'all see that? Right. I think the reaction of the Omanis and the Arabs to this normalization is much more important yep. in what's good, in how that they go forward in whether or not the pushback in the Arab world towards the normalization. Position. That's what's going to decide whether or not there's going to be some Democrat or whoever who says, you know what, we need to sort of back down again and this is, this is going to become serious. That's, that's really what the factor that, 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 that we have to look at. I don't think the Democrats and Republicans are both. I think that the Iran deal was, was an aberration I think, and, and it, was, you know, like, it, it, was, it was an amazing one. Mm -hmm. but, but it was an aberration to the point where like, it, 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 it happened, but it, it didn't have enough support within American society, within American political culture, for it, for it to sustain itself. Right, and I think what's going to happen now is really they're going to they're going to see war with Iran. Is it possible or not? What, what are they going to become? Is it an become? issue in like American politics? 
What well, is foreign policy an issue? Will it make a difference where the Democrats stand or the Republicans what, stand? That's my question. What I'm, what I'm saying is what's election? going to happen internationally, the reaction to the normalization of Israel, the reaction to the possibility of war with Iran in Iran, in the Arab world, that's, that's what's going to decide it. I don't think it's going to be decided in the current. I think it's bipartisan. It's, 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 I think it's bipartisan. There are certain parts that you, you raised a, point, a very important point that I was going to get to, which is you know, moving outside the Republican versus Democrat, there is the issue of a, a context of the past at least 10, 15, if not more years, where America is slipping out of this region, where there's a lot of pushback, resistances, whether it's ISIS kind of resistance or, you know, resistance in Palestine and in Lebanon and all these kinds of countries. There's definitely an interaction there. But within this question of whether things will change in America in terms of the way they, they look about it, I think in the Middle East there's bipartisan there's more or less bipartisan support for similar kinds of issues. Yes, but except in places like Yemen, where I think they, they, can, they can play on that. But Karim, of course, I mean, the world is larger than the United States of America. We see now in the case of Iran that uh, the Europeans start to develop different approaches. And uh, uh, when, uh, in case the Democrats uh, take over the government uh, one day, then they can choose whether they uh, they, they can choose between past dependency of the Trump administration or following a more differentiated approach that was developed by the Europeans. Right, it was a multilateral deal. People tend to forget that. This was one reason there was such an extraordinary deal. And the same with you know, Paris uh, Climate Accord. I mean, we didn't, you know, climate change, we're seeing in California the ramifications of it. And in this part of the world, um, climate yeah, change, yeah, certainly. People, people forget that Obama was the one who killed the deal that was happening in the climate change. He came in, and even in Copenhagen, and they started to overturn this question of having UN and international law that was regulating and making it, turning it into voluntary. So Obama was one of the guys that actually helped to kill a certain level of, of international environmental policy making when it comes to climate change. Well, so, it is a problem that the U.S. domestic, you yeah. know, what the U.S. domestically will yeah. keep you in office to have power exactly. determines these things internationally. Exactly. You're correct. Right. And in terms of the Europeans, I agree. I think, in fact, Iran is, is the final, I think, the final kind of standing ground. Will the Europeans have any ability to have a, a, a policy, at least in the Middle East, within this wider region, that's independent of the U.S.? In general, when I go anywhere, the idea of, of the of, uh, you know sort of European uh, policy here, people start to snicker. You know, they start to when it comes to Palestine, when it comes to Syria, when it comes to all these places, they're simply appendages to American foreign policy. Iran, they, they it was something that was interesting, and they did it because Obama was able to to push it through. That's what that's to happen. Now the question is, because of Trump, will the Europeans say no? They take a position and actually fight for it. That's an interesting question. I think this is where. If they can do that, then they start carving a slightly independent position. Fine. But up until now, the only reason Iran happened was because Obama was pushing it very strongly. And the fact that Obama goes and Trump counts, the Europeans complain about it, but so far there's ongoing discussions, but they haven't really made a, a real push. That's the reality. And well, if, the if other hegemonic power, of course, is China. You know, and China in this region, well, you know, you brought Europe and it's, you know, no one sort of doubts that uh, China's, you know, sort of foreign policy world, you perceive it likely to be better for this part of the world to have China involved in, you know, as the hegemonic power. I, I, you know, ideally you don't want a hegemonic power at all, but I don't think that's terribly likely. Oh, I thought Russia is also a Russia has become a more, it's more so yeah. kind of a yeah. player here. No, but China is also playing an important role, but it's, it's, I think they're happy to keep a, to stay a little bit in, in, in the background, have, have uh, you know, other, secure, other people kind of ensuring a certain sense of stability, and then they're moving in slowly. But the Russians now are, have a direct role in this delay of this. Well, uh, any final thoughts here uh, uh, about where we're going? But we have one one question, and if you want to then answer the question and make that also a final thought from each of our panelists, uh, we could go on and we would, uh, but we're not going to. So please uh, have the final question, and everybody, uh, you know, try to address it and or a final thought about. Uh, you know, where you it's think uh, uh, things are going in the U.S. That would be a good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one, yeah, question. Just, uh, one question that is really important to this country, which is how in this election, uh, and this is to you, Professor Max, but all, all of you can 
this answer, and I have another question for you. Um, in terms of the House and Senate, how much more pro-Israel could it become? You mentioned angles, and I, I feel like it's just becoming more and more uh, overall. Uh, it's, it, Palestine's becoming more an option. And so my question to you would be, um, what's the percentage of women uh, that actually were elected come out as pro-Palestine? Well, um, the... Uh, which one was it? Omar? No, but there, there's, there, there are people now who are... Yeah. And the question she, was how, how much more pro-Israel... She, she, and then she, women in particular. Yeah. But Tali, she's, yeah, she, yeah. I, so she's in Minnesota or Michigan? Michigan. 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 So, um, uh, right, so with the election of, you know, not just women, but certain, you know, uh, kinds of women, she was known on Twitter for just being, I mean, they were surprised that she was able to get elected yeah. because she was very intelligent about it, saying, you know, that it was actually anti-Semitic to be anti-Palestinian, right? You know, and, and, and actually uh, crafting a good argument um, that at the end of Obama's administration going to the UN, people were starting to, you know, in the waning days, to do that, not because he, somebody's any less or pro, I, I'll leave that to, to, to analysis, but that's what's interesting about the age group. So that's the other thing we haven't talked about is that the age group that was averaged something like 60 some, now has just gone down to 49, right? And with younger groups coming in, all of this ideology that I grew up disagreeing with about the region, as it were, Along these questions, it's a, it's a it's a it's a reboot in a lot of ways. It's not controversial. What are we going to do about these people that you're talking about, Mercers and Cook Brothers and Edelson, who it's it's money that comes from that era? Well, again, we have mortality on our side, but also that's where a lot of the resistance is not marching in the street. It's nice. It makes us feel good. It makes people nervous but it's groups dealing with infrastructure, new donor uh, partners, and you have to have young women that want to have a career starting in the house saying, this is a human rights violation. This is not pro or against Israel-Palestine. This, this is a human rights violation, Pumped, right? And so, very successful. Uh, that's one. Okay, we got one. It's a C. Very optimistic because of all the deaths that are intended. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, please, uh, if uh, everyone That's would, uh, you know, uh, address the question and uh, whatever final thoughts about uh, what the ostensible subject of the panel. What does it mean for the world? What does it mean? We talk a lot about the U.S. What does it mean for this part of the world? What does it mean for the world? Uh, any final thoughts on on uh, either of those questions? I mean, I, I it remains to be seen, obviously, but I do think the fact that uh, much more of the world is represented in the U.S. election, um, in, in in the U.S. House in particular, uh, after this election, um, there were immigrant. Uh, women, especially, uh, elected from a variety of different parts of the country. Um, my experience teaching at the most diverse university in the United States is that there, um, the kind of verities that we sort of accept in American politics are not accepted by the students that I teach, that things are up for debate in ways that they aren't yeah. at other universities I've taught at. Um, I, <laughs> I'm not tremendously optimistic about the United States changing its position on Palestine I, 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 until there are donors yeah. for whom Palestine is an issue that can step up with the kind of money that um, are stepping up with like the, the sound is it's, it's, exactly <laughs> <David's society. laughs> um, it always comes back to yeah it's, it's I'm, I'm, I'm pessimistic because I don't see uh, I don't see it as being a, a, a place where any I can't look at anybody in the US uh, Congress right now for whom that's going to be the rock upon which they build their political church. I just don't see it. I mean, I think to, to answer the question, I think, so on the one hand, and I want to try to be a little bit positive, but on the one hand, there is something. I think there is something that's important. Uh, so in terms of the political system, it's bipartisan, and as I was saying, 
it's different forms of Zionism. One is this kind of you know, labor Zionism, one is Buddhist Zionism. Both have exactly the same goal. And neither will allow for Palestinian statehood or meaningful self-determination. That's, that's been clear. That's been, from the Oslo process on, very clear that there was never going to be a Palestinian state. There was never going to be a proper self-determination or a just solution in any of this. All that stuff was pipe dreams. And we know this now. I mean, that's pretty clear either way. In terms of the, if I want to be a little bit positive, it's that there is a growing gap between what's going on, this kind of incredible Senate Congress support for Israel, mm -hmm. and what even among you know, younger Jewish uh, activists and community people, the, the, the polls show that there's a big difference now. They're not willing to be like the previous generation where there's just unflinching support. There's increasing support for, at the very least, a meaningful two-state two solution type thing. I mean, some kind of meaningful, at least a, you know, attempt at a meaningful thing, is that's increasing. And I think it's increasing on college campuses in general. But it also means that there's a lot more uh, dangerous fights that are going on. Mm -hmm. So whether it's academics being tossed out for saying something, or students now, you know, there are these groups, I can't remember what they're called now, but there's a lot of these groups that are... Watchdog things. Yeah, campus watch, but there's, there's now the new ones, I can't remember what this... Uh, Canary. Uh, Project. Canary. Which one? Canary. Canary, Canary, right? There's this Canary thing, which is now the new thing, is that they're no longer going after only faculty members and, and things like this. They're not going after students and student activists. They're naming them and shaming them and you know, making life very, very difficult. So that, that, that's it's very dangerous, but it's an indication of what they're worried about. The second thing that they're worried about when you see Netanyahu and these people coming to America and giving their speeches is they're devoting three quarters of the time to BDS, to the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement, which is growing, which is growing. And this is an issue where, uh, where on college campuses, where on, you know, in certain circles, this is a question that's growing, and so therefore the response is, is, is much greater and it's much more violent. But it, it means that there's something going on, and that's, that's a positive thing. So the discrepancy between the formal American Senate Congress decision-making apparatus and, on the other hand, kind of what's going on on the ground, potential, potential change, I think that's where, you, that's where you find it. And that should ride the kind of progressive, if there is a progressive change, that should, they should be going hand in hand. Yeah. So, uh, Julie, Daniel, Koros, any final uh, thoughts, comments? What I would want to say um, is what the way I want to frame Trump. I'm saying this because I'm going to teach a class on Trump. Trump is an excellent person. I want you all to pick. Um, the way I think we have to go forward understanding it is that, okay, so this happened, and this, this person who is really, really an aberration in so many ways to American politics, although we can also see how, how it happened, but it's, it's disrupting some major sort of processes that, that, that were continuing in the world, right? And I, and I want to say something about this question about foreign policy is totally random. There is an anti-globalization right now that's becoming dominant in the world that really Trumpism and Trump is, is, is really pushing forward. There was the way that globalization was happening that certain sections of people who want America, the, the, the capitalist class in America didn't like. Certain sections, not all of them, there's a split within the ruling class in America. You got the Koch brother types, and you have the Microsoft, the Bill Gates types. And those are not necessarily have the same interests when it comes to opening up new markets and, 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 and sort of the, the process of globalization. And I think part of what Trump uh, showed is a battle between in that realm, right? And that, what that means is that we don't know what's going to happen, but the, the old kind of like NATO and NAFTA and all these different ways that sort of borders were, were kind of lift, lifting for capital to flow, but then they were closing for, for migrants to flow, that's kind of, that's, that's being disrupted, and we don't really know what's going to happen. And there are other disruptions as well within American domestic politics that I think, I don't want to say it's the silver lining, I don't want to say anything good is going to come out of it, but I think there's a, there's a certain amount of space that's opening up for activists and for people who, who want to have a different way of imagining the world, for them, for, for, for them to think. And I think Trump is much a product of that, but, but also the way he's kind of pushing that forward is, 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 is kind of bringing us to ask questions that I, think, I don't think we would have been asking if you know, Hillary Clinton had won, if sort of politics as, as, as usual had continued. And I think this is the kind of conversation that we need to have as activists, as Arabs, as, as you know, people who care about very specific things, things in the world. What does it mean for the US to really be, become more and more um, marginalized when it comes to the Middle East, as it might happen if the Iran deal, go, uh, if the Iran deal gets, you know, they pull out of it, but it continues with European support, with Chinese support, with maybe you using something other than the dollar, the petrodollar, you know what I mean? This could really create a, sort of a new formation in the world. And
and we don't really know. But I think those are the questions uh, that we need to be asking, and hopefully that will help us make sense of what's going on. And Daniel and Julie, a final thought, and then uh, we'll be pushing on. Well, I guess it's always good to end with something for coming, positive. Michael. Um, so uh, this time, out of 35 senators that were up for re-election, 26 out of 35 were already with the Democratic Party, so it was a, a difficult uh, map. Next time, uh, out of the 33 senators that are up for re-election, 22 are with the Republican Party. So the next time, the political map is more favorable for the Democratic Party. Yeah, but no, I would like just to say something positive to 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 I mean I mean looking at all the voter suppression etc. This makes quite depressed. But of course there are also like other developments going on. Uh, there are many states in the uh, many states in the U.S. Uh, um, that uh, uh, allow referendums, and uh, some of the referendum results were quite promising. I already referred to what uh, was uh, decided in Florida on allowing fairness and former fairness to vote. Uh, but I think there are now 33 states that have legalized marijuana. Um, there were also a number of states that uh, uh, restricted uh, voter suppression in the future. So I think some of the, the ballot initiatives had quite promising results. And I'm not only referring to the fact that David Beckham is now allowed to build a soccer stadium in Miami because that was also a bad definition. Um, in fact, the value politically of the marijuana laws is that when the elections go badly next time, we have a way to uh, do exactly. yeah, right. better. But, um, but I think, but I think, uh, uh, so, um, uh, okay, so, uh, uh, I mean, Trump delivered. I mean, he destroyed the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, and. Uh, uh, he uh, 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 cancelled the Paris uh, uh, Treaty, uh, but we have a counter wave, you know, on the municipal and state level. And many municipalities and states have voluntarily declared they would fulfill the uh, 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 Paris targets. So there are also positive developments going on, and maybe uh, uh, we are going with a better feeling home if we focus on the on those developments. <laughs> okay, the last, the last word is Julie's. Uh, I think I've on that, uh, two things, the, the governorships, you know, when the Democratic Party got rid of their focus on making governorships, it's not an accident that that's when the gerrymandering started happening, taking back governorships, changes, all of these infrastructural things that have become all too American, and I'm glad you brought up the two capitalisms because tech and Silicon Valley might start to replace with some of the policies that you're doing. Because, you know, nice thing, the nice thing about Silicon Valley, the, the, the curious thing about Silicon Valley is that it's very immigrant heavy and it's not phobic about the areas. And so, you know, I'll leave it with that. It's ominous when big tech money is the future of these ideals, but, you know, roll the dice. That's probably where we should be looking. And that's well, American Holly, so expensive. Uh, please come back and see Tim on Thursday talking about the uh, newest Thank you all. That was wonderful. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>